When a great person passes away, it's the end of their life because they have completed their mission in this world. But for us, it's only the beginning. Even three years after Rebbe's passing, we have to start again and again learning, reviewing who Rebbe was, how great he was, what made him great, and most importantly, how did Rebbe become that way? I cannot think of a better person to talk to about this than his Rebbetzin, Mrs. Leia Trink, who stood by his side for over a half a century and helped him accomplish what he has accomplished. And the Rebbetzin graciously agreed for me to interview her so all of us can be inspired to learn from Rebbe's ways. When the Art Scroll book was published, Just Love Them, written beautifully by Shirley Besser, the Rebbetzin got a call from one Mechanach who asked her, it's hard for me to believe that such a person never existed, but I have one question for you. Was he born this way? Or did he work on himself? And I said to him, what do you mean? I believe that he was born normal, like every other person. So it's obvious to me that he worked on himself. But he had a lot of models of who he wanted to be like. He wanted to be Mike Tress. He wanted to be Reb Shmuel Brittany. He wanted to be Rabbi Feigemail. And he always talked about it. And he told his own Talmidim about them. Rabbi Feigemail, I'm used to say, boys, if you'll be good, the way Rebbe grew and became what he became was because he always aspired to be like his Rebbeim, to be like the people he admired. And this film attempts to talk about Rebbe the same way he talked about his Rebbeim, so we can aspire to be like him in the same way he aspired to be like them. Rebbe's signature characteristic was Ayan Taivo. He had the ultimate good eye. Everything was good. Nothing was ever a problem. Nothing was ever bad. When I started telling him, like, did you notice that I just told our child to do and he walked away? Like, could you help me? He said, what? Like, what did he do? He never saw it. Rabbi Trank was a master at noticing the good in anyone and everyone, highlight it, and talk about it. The story that Rebbitson tells over when Rebbe passed away, and now she had to take the car in to Lipa's garage where her husband, where Rebbe would usually take it. She says, I'm going to take care of you, Mrs. Trank. But before I tell you, I want to tell you a story about your husband. We have a customer. He's a truck driver. He brings in his truck for maintenance. He's very big, heavy. But the main thing about him that's like so intimidating is the tattoos on his entire body. It's scary looking. When he comes in, everybody takes two steps back. He said, but one day he came in and your husband was sitting in one of the seats in the waiting room. And your husband got up, walked across him, put his arms around him, gave him a hug and a kiss. And he says to him in front of everyone, my brother, you know, so good to meet you. How are you? Ugh, everyone is cringing. So one man said to him, are we trying to know him? He said, no, but he's our brother. Do you see the mug and David that he's wearing? No one ever saw that he wore a mug and David. So Lipa said to me, you know, that person, he melted in front of everyone's eyes. All of a sudden, he wasn't that big, scary ogre that everyone thought he was. When I came to yeshiva, ninth grade, I had a hard time coming to Shachris. Rebbe would come wake up the Bachram every morning, 20 minutes, half hour before Shachris, come back 10 minutes before Shachris, and then he would come back during Shachris itself. And he would be in his talus and fillin, and he would be yelling, Baruch Sha'amar Vaha Yaha We would hear his voice still from down the hall, and we would be in bed. So everybody, everybody at once would jump out of bed and run into their closets and hide. So when Rebbe opened the door, nobody was in bed. But we weren't in this Madrash either, and Rebbe was no fool. He knew everybody was in the closet, but he never, ever opened the closet door. He never looked to catch anybody. And this would go on for weeks, for months. And then I remember one time I came to Shachris, it was like close to Aleinu, close to the end. And I walked in and Rebbe would sit in the back of the Besam Adrish and he saw me walk through the door and he jumped up. He was so excited to see me. Aleinu l'sham He celebrated my coming late that one time as if I showed up to Vasikin. If someone does something wrong, you want to tell them, especially if you are the mother, the teacher, you feel like that's your mission. I have to tell them what they're doing wrong and what they should do right. My husband never did that, never did that. In yeshiva, you were not allowed to smoke. And yet, everybody smoked. And rarely was anybody caught. The reason was because Rabbi Trank, when he came to the dorm, he sent messages 
in the form of his own voice, Trank is coming! Trank is coming! To let everybody know he's coming. Put out the cigarettes, put away whatever is not supposed to be out. He doesn't want to criticize. He doesn't want to talk to, down to his Talmidim. So he didn't do it. Rebbe made a choice to focus and zoom in on that Dover Taiv, on that Nakuda Taiv, that point of good, amplify it, talk about it, and celebrate it until you celebrate it yourself. Boys who came to my husband's class, they were already feeling like garbage. Everybody didn't want to have them. Nobody saw the good in them. When my husband would tell them how good they are, they denied it. Like, no, Rebbe, I didn't even mean what you think I meant, because I'm really stupid. But he proved to them otherwise, it's not true. You are smart. And everyone says about him, he made me believe that I was something that I didn't know that I was. Like he knew it before I knew it. Rebbe was so consistent and persistent about us being great that with time, it started impacting us. It started penetrating and we started believing it. When we had the yeshiva here, my husband was the bus driver. He picked up everyone every morning, brought them to yeshiva, to Davin, and it was a very difficult job because everyone was still sleeping when he came to the house. They're not waiting for the bus. There was one boy that he went to every single day for two years. He never came back with my husband. He never came to Davin, but my husband never stopped. Every day he went to get him. And even after he came, he just would put his head down on the desk and just go to sleep. He never davened. My husband never said a word to him about davening. But one day he came over to my husband, and this he's telling us the story. He told my husband that it's Rosh Chodesh, Rebbe, and I forgot to say Yala Biyavo and Shmona Esrei. I guess by then he was a little bit davening. Do I have to repeat Shmona Esrei? He asked my husband. And my husband didn't answer him. I guess my husband had a hard time answering that question because he knew this boy doesn't like the daven. So finally, my husband said to him, you know, if you're asking me the halacha, if you have to say Shmona Esrei over again, the halacha is that if someone forgets Shmona Esrei on Rosh Chodesh by Shachris, yes, he does have to repeat Shmona Esrei, but I have to tell you something. Your question is better than the answer because nobody asks that question. And he said, since that time, he never didn't dive in chakras, and he never forgot to say yalla v'yalla. When Rebbe complimented me, he was so overly effusive in his praise that you kind of took a step back and questioned it. Is that just his way of talking? Or does he really, really mean it? It was really hard for me to get used to my husband being like that because in the beginning, my husband told me he loved me before we ever got engaged even. Now we get married. It's the first time I'm walking with him in the streets of Barabak where he knew every person in the streets, I thought, because never would someone pass him by that he's not greeting them and saying hello to them. And he also says to everyone, I love you. I finally say to him, do you say that to everyone? He says to me, it's not the same. And you could see that love when Rebbe was sick. I remember I came a few times and I sat there for a few hours each time. And when I walked in or anybody else walked in, his eyes sparkled, they lit up when Talmidim walked in because you can tell that love, that bond that he had for each and every Talmud. One day during Shiva, well, the Talmidim from many years, different ages, they were competing with each other of who Rebbe loved the most. And everybody said he was the most beloved student. I was the most beloved. And everyone had a story to prove it. Rebbe had the remarkable ability to love a Talmud even when the Talmud targeted him or was angry with him. Rebbe doubled down on that love. There's one guy in yeshiva who had an anger issue. Rebbe talked about this Talmud as if he was the Godel Hadar. He would come home, tell his wife and children, I have this Talmud who is the greatest of the great. He is smart, he's bright, he's learning. Once in my house, while we were eating lunch, I don't know what bothered him, but there was hot food on the table, lasagna, soup that I made. He took the table, he put his hands under the table and threw it at the boys on the other side of the table. And like my first thought was, I'm never gonna get this kitchen clean again. It was all over the place. I said to my husband, this boy, Chaim, who you love, that's the one who flipped over the table? I, w I wouldn't even wanna have him here. He says, what do you mean? He has a problem, I agree, but I love him. One day the Rebbitson was sitting in her office and she hears yelling outside her window. She goes to the window and she sees this Talmud is yelling, assaulting Rabbi Trank. He didn't like something that my husband did in Night Sayer. And as he screamed at my husband, he punched my husband in the jaw. I'm watching, and I'm thinking, I'm calling the police. It's crazy, this guy is a maniac. 
but my husband didn't do anything. This young man, he punched my husband six times in the jaw. My husband's jaw was like misaligned. He had to go to a doctor to have it straightened out. He couldn't talk. Fast forward, Rebbe is sick in his final days, and this Talmud shows up. The first words he said to my husband, Rebbe, I have to ask you mechila. My husband? Not well. He said, absolutely not. You have nothing to ask me mechila for. Please do not ask me mechila. Boy, I thought he was going to have another attack because he wanted to do something. My husband's going to stop him. But my husband said to him, Chaim, do you remember the last thing that we learned when you were here in the yeshiva? We never finished it. Let's finish learning now. I could cry. I could cry even right now because this boy, you know, to me, there's something wrong with him and he hurt you. And why don't you let him ask you mechila? My husband learned with him. He left. When he left, I said to my husband, why didn't you let him ask you mechila? Because he kept on saying, but Rebbe, I have to ask you mechila. That's what my husband said to me. Leia, if a boy had a bad complexion and it's oozing and you're echoed from it, does he have to ask you mechila? I feel like I'm so lower than my husband because I didn't even know what my husband was talking about. Why? What? What does one thing have to do with the other? He said this boy had a problem. We knew he had a problem. He can't manage anything. So he has to ask me mechila. Rebbe realized that his anger is only skin deep. Behind every obnoxious act, there's a cry for help. It wasn't personal. Ah, he punched me, he hurt me. He doubled down with love and care. He always told his Talmudim, he is the luckiest Rebbe because he has the best voice. It wasn't a technique to get you to believe how great you are. He genuinely, genuinely, genuinely believed that he really felt this way about you. He was always telling us, our whole family, such a Gvaldu Gebacher, so special. Oh, he's so special. He's so in love with him. He's so excited that he came to his class. My children thought that Adelphi Yeshiva had the best Talmudim. My daughter once heard in camp, a girl said, oh, you're an adult, oh, that's the yeshiva that, you know, the boys who can't get into yeshiva. She's like, what? Like, no way, it's the best boys. Rebbe had no problem standing up and screaming and yelling about the greatness of a boy, of a Talmud, or even a random individual he had just met. I was speaking in a school in Muncie, and a woman came over to me, you don't know me. She said, but I used to live near you in Lakewood. I had a child that was totally deformed, not regular, nothing was right about her. I never wanted anyone to see her. Well, one Shabbos, she was walking with the stroller, and all of a sudden she looks up, my husband is standing there. So she says, oh, hello, Rabbi Trank. He says, do you mind if I kiss your daughter? He bent down, he kissed and he said, such a beautiful daughter. And I was thinking, if I was that person who was passing her, I think I would have crossed the street only to show her that I don't want to embarrass her. My husband had no inhibitions, had no feeling of like something that he's doing is wrong. And the reason was because it wasn't about him. And that's why he was able to stand up on a chair at a Torah Masur convention or dance on tables at bar mitzvahs, at chasinus, because it was about the message. It was about the audience, what they needed to hear. And he was able to negate himself completely even at the expense of looking and sounding like someone who's pushing the social norms. My husband was at a Tomer Sower convention and Thursday night at the Tomer Sower convention was like Ask the G'daylem. The panel of the G'daylem that were there, like Rebbe Elias Sveiz, that's all, Nevaminska Rebbe, someone raised their hand and they stood up and they said, so like in the end, how do we know who we could throw out of Yeshiva? Who are we allowed to throw out? I see my husband getting up like, like a lion, he stands up on a chair and he's screaming. Like, excuse me? What are we gonna find out here? Who should we throw out? Let's talk about who we should take in. Scream. He got so excited. What a, this is what we're gonna talk about? The who we should throw out? And rebellious face. So he said, we don't argue with Rabbi Trank. The next year, on our way back to the Tower of I figured, this is a good time. It's already cooled off. Love it. Like, I don't think you should get up and say things while the G'dayim that you're not on the panel and it's not up to you and people have things to say. The G'dayim will put them in the place. You don't have to. He? He said, Leia, if anyone dares to say anything about throwing a boy out, you could be sure I'm going to be up there again and say it. 
Did I do something wrong? After lunch, the Suda, they made this big announcement. The Rosh Hashivas are going to now meet with their Talmidim. Rav Gifter will meet in the main dining room. Rav Shechter will meet in the, you know, this ballroom. This one will meet every Rosh Hashiva. Okay. Never mentioned my husband. My husband would just stand up. He'd say, and I will meet with my Talmidim in the kitchen. So most of his Talmidim are working in the kitchen. <laughs> Why are you leaving out his Talmidim? What are they, some kind of second-class citizens around here? <laughs> I came to Adelphia at a time when my parents were going through a divorce. It was a very difficult time in my life. And my first introduction to Rabbi Trank was a hug. He looked at me, oh, Yoeli, Yoeli Gold, a hug. And I never stopped feeling that hug. There was a boy now in the last few years that my husband was that when he graduated eighth grade, Dan Hala told his, the parents, don't even try getting your boy into a yeshiva. No yeshiva would take this boy. Go get him a job. But my husband heard about that boy. He went to his house. He said, I heard that you don't have a yeshiva for next year. I don't have enough boys next year. If you could be my Talmud, I would love it. Come to my yeshiva. One of the fathers who had already a boy here told my husband, you take in that boy, I'm taking out my son. My husband said, everyone could do what they want, and I'm gonna do what I want. He comes here. Today, he's a star. He's the highest Chabura. He had made so many Siyamim. He came when my husband was sick. He came here to make the Siyam with his Rosh Chabura. He's part of Dershu. He's the finest young man. He never held back from telling someone how great they were and how much he loved them. Let's say Reb Matasio spoke. My husband would call him afterwards, Reb Matasio. I loved that speech. Reb Matasio told him, you know, even an adult loves compliments. Reb Ari Malkiel, when he came to Lakewood, the first speech that he made, my husband went to, he called Rebbitz and Rachel Cutler afterwards to tell her what an impression he made on him. Yechiel Spiro, the first book that he wrote, my husband loved it and called him up. My husband couldn't reach him, so he called his mother and told her how impressed he is with Yechiel's stories. I thought to myself when I was Masped Rebbe, Rebbe would jump out of the yarn, run over to me, hug me, pick me up, and tell me, Yaeli, beautiful, beautiful! That's what he did his entire life to me. I was so impressed and enamored with him. I could not believe the things that he did. One of the things that impressed me the most during the six months that he wasn't well was when any Talmud came to see him, any Talmud. It could be from 50 years ago, it could be from 17 years ago. He always remembered what he had learned with them. Whatever Masechta you were learning, he had one Gemara that he would review with his Talmudim every single day until they memorized it by heart. Everybody had a Gemara. You had your Gemara. And every time I called Rebbe, even 20 years later, Yaeli, remember Yavamas? Gufa, the mayor of Daisy Banarkin is a teacher of Sabas Lachin, by a double Kosh Lacham, Nejaran Gwadalena, Gwadalena. I still remember the Gemara by heart. I can say the whole Ahmed. Because every day, the entire ninth grade, he drilled it into us, planting that point of connection between us and him, and he would always come back to it. I remember one man came with eight daughters and his wife. They're standing by the table. My husband says to him, bring me Reb Maisha's book. Read me the first Shaila in that book that they asked Reb Maisha. Do you remember when you asked me that same question when you were in ninth grade? I'm looking at this man, if this man doesn't remember. Don't embarrass him in front of all those eight girls. And how would he remember? But well, my husband remembers. And then he said to him, and what did I tell you? And my husband told him. Whatever question you were able to ask, that's how he defined you. You are the guy who asked that Kashi. Every Kasha that a Talmud asks is the most important cash in the world. Why? Because he's asking it, and he wants to know the answer. We were in Camp Monk, and it's the end of the day, and this young man comes over to my husband, who was in my husband's learning group. So he said to my husband, you know, I went home today to my parents, and I was telling my parents about you, and my father said to me, Rabbi Trang, I had his father when I was in Camp Monk. So my husband says to the boy, no, Yankala, your father didn't have my father. Your father had me. I was his Rebbe. Tell your father when he was in my learning group, I was teaching about how you hold the Becher when you make Kiddush. While I was teaching it, I was using your father as the model of the Becher. Like, I'm thinking, of course the father couldn't believe that he has the same because, first of all, it's many years later. But also the boy is describing my husband. He's such an exciting Rebbe. He jumps on the tables. He's running around the room. He was thinking, whoa, it must be the son of that Rebbe because that Rebbe would now be 78 years old. He's just still jumping on tables. <laughs> 
Watching him and the Rebbitzin was watching a Shalom Bias Class 101. It was unbelievable. First thing he would do when he walked in, his wife was on the couch on the phone, the Rebbitzin, and he went straight to the fridge, poured a cold glass of water, and brought it to his wife. When I visited Rebbe the last time, I was sitting with him on the couch, and he was very frail, very sick, and he barely spoke. And the Rebbitzin would come in and out to check on him. I remember Rebbe whispering to me, and he said, Yaeli, I'm not scared to go. The only worry I have is about my wife. After he was left around, I was going through all the books that he left near his bed and his suitcase, wherever he had. They all have notes to me that he never gave me. He wrote me a note. Lay, I was listening to you talk to Shalimus on the phone. Does she know how great you are? He's writing this to me that he never gave me. Or he'd underline certain things like, Lay, you must read this. It's exactly you. I wouldn't put it past Rebbe if he wrote those notes deliberately and stuck them all over the house for the Rebbitson to find them after he passed away. It's really Besser, what he wrote and that people want to talk to me. People sent me the book reports, little kids. They had to do a report on a gadol, and they did it on my husband. So many kids you can't imagine. And grown-ups, teachers, and Rebbeim, Rosh Yeshiva, Zelik Pliskin. He became my good friend. You know what he told me? He said to me, his whole life, he's been writing books about how people should behave. Well, how you talk to another person, the thoughts that you have for yourself. He said his whole life, he knew there couldn't be such a person, but that's what you aspire to. We're all working to get there. And then he read the book about my husband. When people pass away, the custom usually is to learn Mishnayis, to honor their memory. If we were to ask Rebbe, Reb David Trank, what can we do to honor your memory? I would dare say he would tell us, just recognize how great you are and how great the people around you are. And don't just recognize it, tell them about it. Sing their praises until they sing their own praises. Love them until they love themselves. That's what Rebbe did throughout his life. And I have no doubt that if we do that, we're gonna bring Mashiach one step closer and will be zeichet the Tchias Amesim to Rebbe's embrace once again. Bimheira b'yameinu. Amen. V'yameinu.